thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about correlated observation errors, um, which were mentioned earlier but have been not used. Um, my co-authors are uh, Jemima Tabert, who's a new PhD student, um, uh, other members of the group at Reading, and also several people at the, the Met Office with, that we did experiments with. Um, uh, it's also based on work done by a previous PhD student whose name I failed to put on here, named uh, Stephen. Um, Stephen. <laughs> okay. So, with the development of um, high resolution um, convective permitting models, um, we need to be able to use high resolution data more efficiently. So, this is an important uh, aim. The, um, the context is for um, high impact weather forecasting. The, At present, the problem is that um, the assimilation methods that are used for high resolution data um, assume that the assimilation, that, that the errors in the observations are uncorrelated. This means that about 80% of the available data is being thrown away because in order to try to avoid having correlations in the assimilation. So our goal is to try to um, improve that by including observation correlations uh, in the assimilation procedure and therefore give us better accuracy. Um, so as I said, observation errors are assumed uncorrelated in the assimilation. This means that the observation error correlation matrix is a diagonal, so it's easy to invert and it's easy to implement computationally. Um, so this is an important reason for keeping it there and it maintains computational efficiency. Um, however, observations in real data are certainly found to be correlated. Um, as long ago as 2009 and 10, observation uh, error correlations were found in both the Met Office and the ECMWF data. Um, this is an example of the Met Office errors data correlation matrix. Um, and you can see that there are large correlations, particularly between channels, um, uh, which are humidity channels. There's also some in temperature channels. And so you can see these are quite strong correlations and they really should be taken into account. Um, using observation error correlations in the assimilation has now been shown to improve the analysis. It incre increases the amount of information content in the analysis um, and uh, it gives us uh, better skill scores in practice at the Met Office and ECMWF and also N NRL, uh, the Navy Research Lab. So this is our goal, is to try to understand more about this. So it's important to account for these observation error correlations. Um, it avoids the thinning uh, that we've talked about earlier. Um, and as I said, it improves information content, gives us better analysis accuracy, improved skill scores, and uh, the error correlations can be diagnosed now by techniques such as Dave Roger and Hollingsworth Lundberg. Um, yesterday, Joe, Joe Waller had a poster showing several different types of observations where we've been calculating the diagnostics using the Dave Roger um, and success successfully. Um, so <coughs> it is possible. Um, and so also we can if we can find feasible ways to implement them. And so now this is becoming a re reality, a real possibility. Um, what I'm interested in is trying to diagnose what the effect of including these correlated observation errors on, on the assimilation problem itself. Um, and I've, we've, we've started by taking a simple example, which is essentially a 3D VAR example. So we're uh, assimilating of data at just one time point. Um, it's, I'm talking about variational methods. Um, on the other hand, the LETK or the ETKF, the, the ensemble filters are also trying to solve this same problem. Um, the problem essentially gives us, uh, for those who haven't seen variational assimilation, the solution um, of this is the best uh, maximum a posteriori Bayesian estimate for the um, for the initial state given the background, 
or for the current state given the background prior, um, uh, assuming that there are certain Gaussian assumptions made on this. So, so it has a very positive uh, reason for, for choosing this particular approach. So the question is then, what is the effect um, on the behavior of this system by changing R from being a diagonal matrix to including the correlations in the matrix. Um, for these optimization problems, the rate of convergence and the accuracy of the solution that you can get computationally um, depend on or are bounded by the condition number of the problem. Um, a lot of you probably know the condition number of a matrix, uh, the condition number of an optimization problem can be shown to be essentially the conditioning of the Hessian, the matrix of the Hessian of the, of the optimization problem. Um, and what's interesting is that this Hessian has this particular structure with the B and the R matrices here, which have to be inverted. So this is going to be sensitive to the conditioning of these two matrices. Um, and uh, the, the, the R and the B matrix, the variances and the correlation length scales of these errors turn out to have a strong influence on how well you can solve this problem and how fast you can solve the problem. Um, we can establish a theorem. This looks like a very messy theorem, I'm sorry. Um, but the key effects of it are this is the uh, condition number we're interested in. Of course, it's bounded below by one always. Um, and it's bounded above by these quantity, this quantity. Uh, which depends on the, the, the uh, condition of the matrix B um, and on also information about the ratio between the eigenvalues of B and R. Um, and this ratio is an important ratio in understanding the behavior of the system. Um, but particularly of interest for us is this minimum R, minimum eigen, these lambdas are the eigenvalues of these matrices. This is the minimum eigenvalue of R. If, if R is diagonal, then this is just the variance. So it's essentially a relationship between the variance of B and the variance of R. And that's a, a significant factor. Um, but in, in this case, this minimum R is, is affecting both the lower band and the upper band on this condition number. And that turns out to be a very important factor. So as this upper band uh, grows, as this, uh, as this minimum eigenvalue uh, gets, uh, uh, gets, gets, gets smaller, so the, the, the ratio grows. Um, and this is an extension of some, the earlier work by another student where we analyzed the whole problem um, in the case where the R was, uh, was diagonal. So this is an extension. Um, the problem that we observe when we try to use the diagnosed correlation matrices um, is that, first of all, they're non-symmetric. Well, we can fix that by just symmetrizing. We don't know what the effect of that error is, but we can do that quite easily, and it's done all the time. Um, the variances tend to be too small that we get from the diagnostics. Often, the matrices are not positive definite, so something has to be done to make them positive definite. And to the real point is that they're very ill-conditioned, which means it makes the optimization problem extremely hard to solve. Um, and in practice, the Met Office, when they tried to use these um, in the data simulation, have had to make corrections to the model, be, uh, to the system, because they couldn't use it otherwise. So, some key questions that we were interested in. What happens if we change the length scales and the background and the, uh, the, R, the observation error correlations? Um, what does the choice of, how does the choice of observation operator affect things? How tight are the bounds? Um, and how does this minimum eigenvalue affect things? And can we, can we do something to fix the problems? Um, well, this is just a diagram of some results that came from uh, uh, some, some idealized studies. Um, this is with one particular choice of an op observation operator, um, uh, which is just uh, choosing, uh, observing the first set of observations um, of a set of a, of, sorry, I should say this, uh, an advection model where we observe the first half of the uh, variables and not the second half. And here they, we observe every other one. Here the bounds are tight, uh, the bounds of the dashed lines. And this depends on the condition, the, the uh, length scale of the matrix B. So the condition numbers all increase as the length scale of B occurs. And also the colors represent the conditioning with respect to the um, uh, uh, the length scale of the matrix R, and these also increase as you increase the length scales. So we know that everything gets worse as the length scales get worse. 
And the same with this one. This one is the, the condition numbers are between the bands, so we know that the bands are effective as well. Um, I'm going to skip that one, and you can look at it when you look at the pictures later. Um, so one of the problems, that, so, so what we want to do is to try to improve the conditioning of the problem, because we found that because the R matrix was so badly conditioned, we couldn't solve the optimization, the data simulation problem. So we've um, tried to improve the condition of R by increasing the eigenvalue or changing the eigenstructure of the diagnosed matrix R. And in this case, there are two different methods that have been looked at, but I'm only going to talk about um, the, the second one. Um, so we've done some operational tests at the Met Office using their OPS model, which is their pre-processing system for essentially um, retrievals, satellite retrievals. Um, and we want to test the qualitative conclusions of this in this system. So we're going to fo focus on observations from IASI um, and uh, note that the observation operator is very nonlinear in this case. And we want to see how changing the minimum value of this uh, matrix R affects the um, condition. I'm sorry, we're going to use the ridge rid rejection method. Um, sorry. Okay, so here's the, uh, some results from the experiments. Um, this is the, uh, these are the eigenvalues of the original diagnosed R matrix for this system. Um, and this is what we've obtained by um, conditioning the matrix, reconditioning the matrix R. That is increasing the eigenvalues so that they're not so extreme. So the condition number is, is, satisfies a given, given constraint. Um, in this picture, you can see what happens to the standard deviations, the variances that we get from these matrices. The red one is the one which is actually used in practice. So it's, it's, it's big, in, big, in, big variance inflation on this problem. Um, the blue one is what's diagnosed from the diagnostic errors. Um, and it's, as, as we said before, it's, it's very small. In fact, in some cases, it can be smaller than what's believed to be the instrument error. So it's not a good estimate for the variances. But when we recondition it, we improve that, and the problem becomes easier to solve. Um, what is the effect of doing that? Well, the effect of doing that in this case is that the retrieved temperature um, profiles look pretty much the same. But the, pre, the, the retrieved humidity profiles um, are, have changed. We don't know whether that's for the better or the worse. That's something we have to try to find a way to evaluate. Um, but it's clear that, again, the humidity channels are the ones which we know are more highly correlated. And so we do expect more of an effect on using the correlations uh, in the assimilation. Um, third thing is we've got a. The, the, these experiments were in a 1D, 1D system, and so there were, the observations were being updated. Each, um, each one was updated, so we had a lot of tests, a lot of solutions. But basically, these are, th these are different choices of the matrix R, depending on how we did the reconditioning of the matrix R. Um, I can get the colors right. Let's get myself myself. Um, this is the old one that was used in the Met Office. They've got a new operational one, which is the dark green. Um, and the one which, which we've um, improved the most is the dark one. And basically, the histogram shows that we use a lot fewer observations, a lot fewer iterations for the reconditioned matrix than for the original ones or the operational ones. So the number of, the number of uh, iterations we need to, to achieve a solution is given along here. Um, the choice of R again is here, and these, this is the showing the condition number of, of, the, of all these different uh, experiments that we'd had to do. Um, and you can see that the worst is the operational one. Um, the new one, uh, the old one is very good, but that was just a diagonal. Um, and the new one, um, the condition number is up here. So we see that the condition number being made smaller is improving the rate at which the system converges. So operational experiments, the summary is we've developed a theory on reconditioning the matrix. We have some more theoretical results for that. Um, we have an impact on the temperature retrievals were not very big, but on humidity where they were effective. Reducing the condition number reduces the number of iterations we need to solve the problem, and reducing the error variance increases the number of iterations, which is something which I didn't show in detail, but this is one of the major early results we got by looking at the cost function 
by looking at the, the theory. And you can see that, um, that by changing different variables, uh, you, you can make things worse and better. Okay. Future. Um, well, we'd like to know more directly what reconditioning R does to the condition of S. Um, we want to investigate preconditioning. Um, the, the problem in, in practice when R is not um, is a diagonal can easily be um, preconditioned by using the background prior matrix to do preconditioning on the problem and make everything much better. Um, we don't know how that should work or can work if we have this correlated R matrix. So that's a big open question. Um, and we want to investigate the effects of this on a full, full 4D VAR and hybrid systems and also on LETKF systems or at least ETKF systems if we can. Um, and so for the future, there's lots more challenges left. Thank you.